Welcome to ATL Day Ones with Jarvis and Tanitra. Coming up on today's show, what type of effect would Quinn Snyder have on the other guys? And our special guest, d led gives us the lowdown on what's going on in Indy. And last but not least in For the Culture, is Dan Bishop throwing shade? This is ATL Day Ones, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. I want to start off by saying thank you for making ATL Day Ones your first listen of the day. And remember, we are free and available wherever you download your podcast. And wherever you download your podcast, make sure that you leave us a five-star review. We really appreciate that from you in advance. Today's episode of ATL Day Ones is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. Go get you some money. But T, when we think about the, the, the debut of a uh, Quinn Snyder as the head coach of the Atlanta Hawks. We talked about the effect that he needs to have on Trey Young in order for them to be able to go on a run like he talked about. But, you know, we talk, also talked about how it kind of looked the same a little bit in that opening game against the Washington Wizards with their pink uniforms. Still trying to figure out why they had pink uniforms on. I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> trying to figure that one out. But – I think for I think what really matters going forward in these next twenty these final twenty games, T, is the what type of effect will Quinn Snyder have on the other guys, and who who do you think he will benefit from the most? Yeah, I have a sneaking suspicion that one Sadiq Bay is a happy camper mm. right about oh, yeah. now because yep. that was one of those Quinn Snyder moves that often we would have said, and no offense to Nate McMillan, because we liked a lot of his evolution in how he started shifting things with the roster, right? right. We saw much more improvement this season than we'd seen in seasons past. However, Quinn Snyder was not here to play in his first game. He knows that this is an evaluation, call it an audition, call it whatever you want for this entire roster. That's a big reason why he came in so soon, so that he could kind of evaluate and see what he was working with before they start making offseason roster decisions, right? right? And when John Collins missed at a critical moment a basket that he more than should have made, right. okay, that's Sadiq Bay time. Because at this point, if most of your players are defensive liabilities, then you've got to play to their strengths. And if their strengths are on offense, then bring them in and let them do what they do. I know it didn't amount to an L, but it didn't necessarily have to. It did amount to Sadiq Bay hitting about 50% of his threes and also playing for 27, giving the Hawks 27 solid minutes. So he's my guy where I'm like, you know what? We got something that we saw out of him in the first game under Quinn Snyder, and I, sus I suspect it's only going to get better for these next 20 and the last 20 of the regular season. I'm with you on that because when you think about that, that move was significant to me. We talked about how that, that was kind of like a positive, right? Being able yes. to make the necessary adjustment because that's what we've got on Nate for so long when it comes yeah. to like, dude, you have to adjust your doggone rotation. Sometimes you don't need to do the hockey change lines and all that stuff and um, changing in changing in and out three, two and three guys at a time, especially when you see your players starting to catch fire because yeah. we talked about that with A.J. Griffin. Now, A.J. Griffin has been struggling as of late, and I'm interested to see how what his minutes um, do going down the road. But and I, I, I do believe that Snyder is – is what I'm what I'm really about, having some good thoughts about, some good mm -hmm. I'm optimistic about is the fact that he's willing to make those necessary moves that yeah. need to be made in order to for his team to be successful on on a nightly basis and not necessarily saying, hey, this is what it is, this is my rotation, this is what I'm going with. I, I I've never been a guy, um I, I've never been a, a guy um that, to kind of say, hey, well, this is what I'm gonna stick with and this is what I'm gonna go with. Right. But and, and, like I said, with with the AJ Griffin piece, though, T, mm -hmm. I, I think that that's something that we're definitely going to have to um, monitor a little bit. Yeah. And I do think he could continue to benefit because I believe he benefited not so much from Nate playing him, but from some pressure from the front office saying you're going to play AJ Griffin. He's going to get met. And yep. I think that when he got him, he made always me look produced. good. In, in other words, exactly. for Tra yeah. Travis Link. There it is. Right. <laughs> I, I, would have another Duke I know what guy, I'm doing. Right. I would have another Duke guy. I need this one to really hit. Right. Right. And, exactly. and 
good thing is our, our guy, Lauren, our girl, rather, Lauren Williams over at the AJC asked a question of Quinn Snyder regarding AJ and his limited minutes. And I thought Quinn Snyder had a very introspective, it was simple, but it was still introspective because right. he said, hey, all players pretty much hit the rookie wall. And I can remember years ago, Trey Young saying something around that 50 or 60 game mark. He was like starting to tap out. And Yo, you hear other is... players, yeah, like what? Four, mm -hmm. 50, 60 games? So mm -hmm. it's it's understandable because we're at that very mark. 61, 62 games for AJ, coupled with the fact that he played in the Rising Stars. So he didn't get the traditional all-star break that everyone else got. So Quinn was just saying, hey, recognize he's hitting the rookie wall. We're sure that mentally, physically, you know, physically, I think he's fine, but mentally he'll kind of break out of it and he'll get back to self. What that said to me, Jarvis, is Quinn Snyder wasn't going to put a requiem on A.J. Griffin from what he saw in that game where he got about 17 minutes and just two points out of that game because right. he knows what he's capable of. It's the rookie wall. It's 60 games in, 60-plus games in. You didn't get an all-star break, the end. So, yeah, I would agree with you. I think A.J. Griffin, with just a little bit of a swoon this last week, he's going to benefit, too, from Quinn Snyder getting a, that fresh set of eyes on what he can do. Yeah, and that's what it's all about, getting a fresh set of eyes on this situation yeah. because Lord knows they need it. You know, speaking of eyes, T, all eyes have been on the NFL combine. We talked about what went down with Jalen Carter yesterday, but another dog – Got the talking yesterday, T, and I wanted to play this for you and get your reaction because I think I'm not too surprised that Nolan Smith ended up being one of those leaders. Even when he was got injured and was done for the season, he was still around the team and, and doing what he needed to do to be able to help those, help the dogs get that back-to-back -back national championship. Kids need to hear this. Stick it out. Just because things get tough, don't run away from things. Like in life, if when things get tough, you're going to quit on your wife, you're going to quit on your kids, you're going to transfer on your wife and kids when things get tough. What if, if you married your wife for 10 years and she get cancer, you just going to get up and leave? That's how I think about it, man. You'd be a man of character no matter what you do, and that's how my mom raised me. Jarvis, the wow. first thought I had, and I promise I'm not saying this to make you laugh, so hold your, hold your chuckles. I got you, yeah, I got you. My first thought was Marcus Mariota. Did you hear what a potential rookie just said? Mm. Mm. I know it was frustrating. I'm sure it was very, very disappointing because I'm sure Marcus Mariota came in here thinking that he was going to get two years and possibly then some yeah. to be able to prove that he deserved to be QB1 again. It didn't work out. That's yeah. not an opportunity or an excuse to kind of tap out on the team, which unless the rest of the world is told otherwise in that uh, special that you told me about last week. Right. It, it, se it seems like you tapped out. Nolan Smith is the kind of guy that you want because he's the guy who, in addition to what he brings on the field, that's another leader that you can have off the field, if you right. will. And we're always talking about who's going to help Grady. We talk a lot about who's going to help Grady on the field, but there's a guy that might be able to help him off the field as well because He's a vocal leader. He's obviously an intelligent guy. He understands the game. He has a compassion for the game. And dare I say it, Jarvis, in order for you to see it that way from that commitment standpoint and be able to basically compare and contrast that to real life circumstances, I think that's because you got that dog in you. You're yeah. tried and true. You've been through the fire and you understand what it takes to get out on the other side and not abandon it. And I really, really think that's the kind of guy. I don't know if you get him because our guy Randy Mack and a couple of other pundits are like they are expecting Nolan Smith to absolutely show out at the combine. But if he's available, Jarvis, I sure hope the Falcons take a look, even if it means they've got to take that number 44 pick and move themselves back in the first round to get him. I'm talking about a guy who's about 6'3 or so, yeah. about 235, legit 6'3, long. Yes. And somebody that can come in on third and long yes. and potentially yes. get home. So that's what the Falcons need. I don't care what position position is. If right. he put his hand in the dirt and get home on third and long, bring him in, especially with a guy like that, because that that that's some wisdom right there. That's yes. what I heard. I heard wisdom yeah. in, that, in, that, in that particular thing. And I think that that's what the Falcons need as far as just – guys that can play some football yes. fr first and then you talk yes. about being getting that they having those leadership qualities that you need you sorely need yeah I, I'm, I'm all on board for that so but speaking of something else that you that you sorely need how about this if you're trying to make some money i need you to go 
download that FanDuel app. What you, where can I go download it, Jarvis? FanDuel.com slash locked on. Why are you talking so weird right now? I don't know. <laughs> but I need you to go to FanDuel.com slash locked on because it is the number one sports book in America. How about that? What are you waiting on? It's right there for you to have everything that you need. They have the money lines. They have the over-unders. They even have whether or not how many uh, three-pointers they're going to hit. I've been talking about Trey Young lately. How about this? How many three-pointers – is John Collins going to make? Zero? Go. We'll go. We'll go to FanDuel.com slash locked on right now and go check it out because they have the no sweat first bet. That's where you get up to $1,000 if you don't win on your first bet. If you lose your source and think John Collins going to shoot the lights out, man, FanDuel.com slash locked on got you covered. So what I want you to do, make sure you go take advantage of the no sweat first bet and they're going to have each and everything right there for you because FanDuel is the number one sports book in America and official sports betting partner of the NBA. So, of course, no one can anticipate or even try to bet on and figure out where in the world the Falcons are going to go at eight. But if you wanted to go and hear from an expert where he thinks they'll go, you got to hear from D. Orlando Ledbetter. He of the AJC, the Falcons <laughs> beat reporter, former PFWA president, or as I like to call him, my big bro, as Jarvis likes to call him, big bro, and OG. What's <laughs> happening, D? Hey, Janitra and Jarvis. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's a uh, pleasure joining you all here from Indianapolis at my, I don't know how many combines this game. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered about that, D. Just doing that, we just going to yes. go with a lot. And speaking of being there on the ground, that was one of the reasons we really wanted to reach out to you. We've been talking about you coming on for a while, so we appreciate you coming especially now because we know that it has been pretty much a 24-hour nonstop for you up there, not just to cover the combine itself or to cover for the Falcons, but also with all of the news that came out about Jalen Carter, of course, with him getting the arrest warrant issued uh, from the athens Clark Police Department for reckless driving and racing from that night of that crash back on January 15th, right, that unfortunately took the lives of Devin Willick and Chandler LaCroix. So we know Carter has since turned himself in. He was released from jail bonded out and he's actually back in Indy but it really made us kind of think what is it like what has it been like D on the ground there in Indianapolis as it relates to Jalen and all of these details now coming out surrounding that night yeah um you know we we were you know I knew our, our team was working on the story uh from you know as far as 10 days ago that he was more involved in this thing than um had previously been uh, reported uh, and Alan Judd, our lead investigative reporter for years, he's working with Dylan Jackson. I work with Alan during the Michael Vick dogfighting trial. So, mm -hmm. you know, I really respect the work that he does. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to get videos and uh, the information through public records requests that showed, you know, he had changed the story a couple times, left the scene uh, and, you know, uh, may, may be uh, in criminal jeopardy. So, you know, a couple misdemeanor charges, um, you know, were, were going to be brought or definitely could have been brought, you know, and, and what was a tragic situation. Uh, but, you know, there's some other things that came out of it. Uh, you know, there seems to be a culture of drag racing at Georgia and a culture of the police letting them slide. Mm -hmm. So um, the one that, you know, is, uh, officer who, if I was the police chief, would be immediately demoted. The one that um, let him slide while on the 89, mm -hmm. uh, he's doing 89 in the 45 zone. And he said, you know, uh, we can't arrest you because it's going to be too big. That's, 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 that he should be treated wow. just like everybody else that gets yeah. uh, a speeding ticket. So, um, yeah, that was one thing that came up. And up here, football wise, as soon as that story broke yesterday, um, you know, all the writers were coming up to to us from the AJC, myself and Gabriel Burns, and uh, you know, saying, you know, tell your people good job reporting, but you mm -hmm. know, so forth and so on. And uh, I was like, well, you know, we got to do our part here, and hopefully he's coming. We at that point we kind of thought he still might come, mm -hmm. but um, you know, we found out uh, you know about 10, 20 minutes after his scheduled interview that he would not be speaking to the media. Uh, you know, we had to move on to the next part of that story. It's like, hey, here's a guy considered perhaps the top prospect in the draft. Um, how is this going to affect his draft status? That was the football story. 
Uh, and, you know, we know um, two misdemeanors is not going to shy, scare away too many NFL teams. <laughs> not really. <laughs> but, but, you know, the culture of racing will in that, you know, you don't want to draft a guy that's going to get into a crash a la Henry Ruggs and not be available, and there's two people dead in that case. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the drag racing thing is a red flag at this point. Do you want to put that person in your city? Uh, and, um, you know, some people are going to take him off the board. Uh, some people are, are, are not. And uh, he's probably not going to drop very far. Right. But that's kind of how the story and how that whole day unfolded for us here in Indianapolis. And that was going to be my follow up question to UD, just getting your opinion and not just as a beat reporter for the NFL, but also looking at it from your perspective of being an attorney. And do you kind of how do you see this potentially playing out? Because it's a it's an interesting timeline because it's March 2nd. And, and we got about a month and a half before draft. And we know this is could potentially not be resolved before that. So kind of you, the feel or the sense mm-hmm. is, like you said, it's misdemeanors at this point. But is there a possibility in any laws that you are aware of from the state of Georgia that it could move into another direction that might further impact? Even when I say that, meaning any felony charges that might actually impact mm-hmm. his draft status before April 26, 27? Yeah, legally, um, you know, we are very familiar with DAs overcharging folks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in an accident in a drag racing where two people dead, we might have a case of an undercharge here. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's to the benefit mm-hmm. of the school and the program and the player. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, did he swerve into them? Did he cause, you know, was there for, you know, you can – go with the two charges that they presented and at the top end of the spectrum would have been vehicular homicide. Yes. Yes. Or reckless Mm -hmm. homicide driving. Mm -hmm. So uh, the scale's pretty far and we've seen, you know, we've seen um, in the last years and stuff as more people become more familiar with uh, legal, uh, the systematic um, uh, problems in the legal systems of overcharging and, uh, you know, trying to, to, uh, you know, put people in jail for, you know, minor offenses and and so forth so and on the opposite end of that you got people being undercharged this might be a case here uh of that so i don't um i don't know the exact range on these two misdemeanors i had to get back to football but yeah. um, <laughs> I, I think uh in athens county they, they're trying to you know that's a big the big dog up there is the football program and the police department is going to probably They've worked with them in the past. <laughs> uh, and so I'm thinking they're going to work with them here and uh, try to do what's right and fair by the um, the, the two students who passed away, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, who, do, who are not with, out with, you know, clean hands, you know, driving 104 and alcohol, uh, uh, you know, consumption of, one, of two times the limit. Uh, but, yeah, so as all these facts start coming out, they'll sort through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, people got to slow down. Law enforcement's got to do their job. People got to do a better job to society and uh, then try to move forward uh, in in the future. No doubt about it. I think, you know, one of those things that hopefully all the sides can come come to an agreement as to what makes sense, right? Like you mentioned, because, like, there are people that are no longer with us to defend themselves. and, And that's the thing that you don't, I feel like you shouldn't be putting those people into that that particular conversation again and i just specifically for the families that are all involved with the those people that lost their lives now d mm-hmm. now another little big topic of conversation has been whether or not <laughs> who's gonna be the starting quarterback for 2023 for the atlanta falcons and and terry fondo has been all but uh, uh, wanting to bring people into his head as far as who that guy's going to be and a lot of people have been asking questions trying to get him to say hey this is our guy this is our QB1 and he's refused to do so um, but my question to you is what, what do you think training camps look I want to um, fast forward to training camp what do you think training camps looks like as far as who's going to be in that quarterback room along with Desmond Ritter um, as the Falcons get amped up for uh, the season do you think that draft free agency or do you think it's a combination of both? Well, it's it's a combination of both. You're going to have another – it's going to be uh, another um, veteran, uh, you know, whether it's on the high end or the low end of the veteran spectrum. Uh, 
uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, going to play itself out here in the next few days as Baltimore's got to put a franchise back. <laughs> got to figure it out. <laughs> that's the dream scenario. Right. Uh, I've been talking to my Green Bay people. They don't think uh, – they don't know what Aaron Rodgers is going to do. He's too weird, so they don't know. Um, I can't see him. I don't say envision it. that uh, <laughs> no. as an option. Uh, Jimmy G is, you know, you got to watch that because uh, this is, you got to remember, Arthur Smith was at Tennessee when they decided to salvage Ryan Tannehill. Yes. Mm-hmm. Until they didn't when he threw the three interceptions in the, gym, right. in the playoff <laughs> game as number one seed. So uh, Jimmy G would be somebody they think they could play with. Um, you know, but my thing is, hey, who's going? Who's out there that is? Uh, you're like, okay, you're a championship contender now. There's only one person, and yep. he wears number eight. And then Kyle Pitts has got to change his number. So, uh, <laughs> so Damn, uh, Kyle. You know, that's it. And the draft, I don't know if you, I don't like, you know, the Bryce Young. Do you trade up for that? Um, C.J. Stroud. Um, well, Levis, uh, you know, Anthony Richardson, I kind of got him circled on the list. I want to look at that a little bit more. Mm. Uh, but but then Hendon Henderson, um, you know, you know, they're going to have a chance to get somebody in here that they think they can coach and uh, make uh, better. You know, Ritter was 74th overall in the third round. Uh, you know, competition is good. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe you bring somebody in here that could – you push him, and if you got two quarterbacks, uh, you know, and Logan Woodside as the backup, you know, go ahead and go with it. But the, the um, goal should be to get a quarterback that can take you to the championship. Yeah. Okay. Get yeah. you know, not just to get back in the playoffs, but right. can this person bring a title to Atlanta with the right yeah. weapons and building out the defense and all that kind of stuff? So we'll yeah. see where they go. Uh, they they're going to weigh all their options, and if they can't get anything, uh, you know, they'll they'll move forward with uh, Desmond Ritter. Mm-hmm. Speaking of building defense, which is what I'm all for, D, uh, um, my my whole thing is, like, you know, going back to when they hired Ryan Nielsen, right, and they seemed they were being very, very uh, cryptic about whether or not they run a 4-3 or a 3-4 defense. But, you know, I, you know I, I'm not saying I know everything about football, but what I do know is if you are running a 4-3, that defensive end looks very different than that uh, outside linebacker that's lined up on the outside of that tight end or, or on the strong side of that tight end. So my question to you is, how do you feel they they end up – what do you think they end up moving closer towards when they talk about – I know they say they want to run a multiple, but what do you think they uh, – what do you think they move closer towards as far as a, from a scheme standpoint – whether or not they have the even or odd front, who do you, what what do you think they lean with Ryan Nielsen as defense coordinator? Yeah, they're going to run a three four. That's what they've been drafting for, and all they're saying is, "Hey, we got to play a lot of nickel." <laughs> Basically, <laughs> like, yeah. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> Translation. Basically, like, like man, just say y'all gonna play nickel um, when y'all not in the three four. Um, but right. uh, he did yeah. run a four three down there, and yeah. um, and. Uh, you know, Cam Jordan and, you know, Davenport and the bigger ends. But the Falcons just spent all these resources on these little bitty ends. So, uh, four, four, you know, BQ Specifically Tank. Specifically D'Angelo alone. Uh, D'Angelo, <laughs> you going to try to put 25 pounds on them? I don't think so. So, um, yeah, they're playing a 3-4. People shouldn't get all bit out of shape about it because, um, you know, you might be in the nickel on second down. If you stop them, they're in second and eight. The yep. second, you know, you give them up two yards, you stop the run, then you're in the nickel. So mm-hmm. you're in a four, two, five, or, you know, Smitty and them ran a three, three, five, three, three, uh, five. Yeah. That. So mm-hmm. that's all they're saying is we got to play yeah. a lot of nickel. Yeah. Yep. That's the translation <laughs> on that one. Exactly. So, D, I'm going to hit you with a funny one as we wrap up. It's a two parter. So okay. the A is <laughs> this. So recently you retweeted Scott Peel, and I think you actually. Tweet, re, retweeted him even yesterday and I saw it and I even quote tweeted it on that because of some cool stuff you brought up to, to, to light. The one from a couple weeks ago said, quote, big night at hashtag Shrine Bowl tonight for a few guys repping hashtag HBCUs. Great to get to know these young men this week. We'll see them all in the hashtag NFL. So goes Mark Evans, Arkansas Pine Bluff, Shaq Davis, South Carolina State, 
Jada Kiss Bonds, Hampton, and Dallas Daniels, Jackson State. But D, you quote tweeted and said, heard that Bonds of Hampton had a great week of practice from a few different schools. By the way, not the real hashtag H2U, hashtag you know. Did you have to throw shade on brother like that, D? Did you <laughs> yeah, have to? No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> That's Hampton Institute, you know. He's got to let everybody know. It's only one. So it's H-I, not H-U. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's really what yeah, you're yeah, You know, that's, Dr. Harvey done a lot of great things down there. Uh, my niece went there. But, you know, uh, when I was intern at the Newport Daily News, it was the Hampton Institute. And so we need to uh, go ahead and honor their tradition. I mean, they got a fine tradition. They shouldn't have to try to, you know, climb on to the big boys platform. Can't you know, latch on, right? Yeah. Right. You know, it's only Anger one. honors. <laughs> it's only still, one. He is still shots fired. Still shooting oh, bullets. I love it. Well, it's it. not shade if it's true. Oh. <laughs> oh. No, there you go. no lies told. No yeah. lies you know. told. But on a serious note, I also know a lot of good stuff out of Scott Pioli's family and their support of HBCU. Mm -hmm. yes. You have also yeah. been highlighting some of those great players coming from the HBCU tradition. So yeah. which HBCU players have you seen, whether it's at one of the, the bowl, the senior bowl games or celebration bowl or even combines, who you think might have a legit chance to get drafted in April? Yeah, I got to talk to more scouts on Isaiah Lamb from Grayson, mm, the yeah, 4 a.m. edge rusher. Yeah. He's only 215 pounds. Yeah, yeah. he like yeah. Right, he's right. right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, but he, he, he got it done. Um, mm -hmm. Then the other kid from Prairie View, A&M, and Southern, he's the little <laughs> – He's a little He's five eleven. He some tackle. <laughs> yeah, five ten to eighty two ninety. But Aaron Donald was little too. So True. sometimes the AP, HBCU players are not going to fit on the NFL's measuring chart. And so then, um, like he did with my man uh, from Detroit, um, and uh, Travis, Jarvis, you helped me out here. The, the Jackson State DN, they called him the problem or the truth. Oh, yes. oh yeah, Miller? I know you're talking about. Uh, yeah, James. Uh, yeah. James, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so they got him in the fourth, fifth round. So uh, he yeah. had more sacks than Aiden Hutchinson. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. the mm -hmm. problem or something was mm -hmm. his. He, yes, was his nickname. So I, yeah. I can remember nickname. Yeah, <laughs> I know you're talking James about. <laughs> James the Problem Williams and the Falcons and all uh, true. All uh, truth needs some people that give other teams problems. So, so that would be James That's Houston. Is that, does that uh, yeah, ring Houston. 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 Okay. Houston. Yes, Houston. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Problem. Yep. Yeah, so, so. So Isaiah Land, where you pick him? Yeah. You know, but anybody can get to the quarterback. I don't care how much they weigh. You know, they need to come to Atlanta because exactly. yeah. They need we to, haven't yeah. seen the quarterback on his uh, butter nut. <laughs> yeah. I talked to Isaiah Land down in the uh, at at Senior Bowl uh, mm -hmm. D and. You, he 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 got a good one on the shows. I, I think that that'll be a nice uh, snack for the uh, for the Falcons to be able to get him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And listen, we have a church on every other corner in this city that will lay hands. So maybe they can send somebody up the Flowery Branch to lay hands and teach them how to lay hands too when they see a quarterback at the Benz this coming season. So anyway, D, we appreciate your time. Definitely taking some time out of your super busy schedule because we know that there will be on-field drills today, on-field mm -hmm. drills for both uh, D linemen and linebackers. So mm -hmm. know you got your work cut out for you, but don't be a stranger. Hopefully we'll get you back closer to draft so we can download on whatever in the world they're going to do outside of the branch. So once again, guys, definitely Check out D. Orlando Ledbetter. He is a great read at AJC.com, but I promise you on Twitter, he is an even better follow. So, D, which one do you want him to go to? Because I know, you know, you got two Twitter handles. Which one? Oh, no, the AJC is the work one. And, uh, you know, do a little, uh, you know, the work stuff is over there. And uh, then I have a little fun stuff on my uh, uh, other one. But at D. Orlando AJC. There it is, guys. It's a fun one, unless you went to Hampton. Thanks, you big bro. <laughs> Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, Tanitra and Jarvis. You all take care, and thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Thanks, D. Man, D laid up here dropping these jewels on these folks out here. Anton Shade at uh, Hampton Institute. Right. Yeah, if D called Hampton Institute, I'm going to call it Hampton Institute as well. But, T, this is for the culture. It is the intersection between sports, entertainment, the culture, and sometimes whatever the hell we want to talk about because that's just how we get down on this show. Today is no different. T, I'm going to read to you the exact quote that uh, uh, Mr. Dansby Swanson said in an interview with uh, CBSSports.com and Bob Nightingale. Um, he said, 
You know, we talking about, you know, becoming the Chicago Cub and everything, how everything went down when uh, then free agency and getting married and all that good stuff and trying to figure out what team he's going to play for. Uh, with the con consultation of his wife as well. Um, this team, meaning the Cubs, means so much to so many people, which is very similar from the place I just came from. From the gist I've gotten so far, pro sports in Chicago are a massive deal. Pro sports in Atlanta are like, well, kind of a deal. T, is this man throwing shade? No. D. Orlando <laughs> Ledbetter said he was just stating the facts, and so was Dansby. Chicago is a pro sports town, and how do I know? A Falcons game against the Bears in the bins is a perfect example. Yeah. I don't care how bad the Bears are. There's so, you know, so many transplants from Chicago, from the Midwest here, that you can go to a Falcons game when they play the Bears and think it's a Bears game, a Bears home game. That yeah. speaks to the fact that those ties run deep with that pro team. We don't even have to speak about the Bulls because, honestly, it's the same way at State Farm when the Bulls and the Hawks get together, right? right? Now, as far as Braves, I do think Braves are probably on par with the Cubs. The Cubs just may yeah. have more history, more legacy, if you will, because yeah. they've just flat out been around longer and been in the same city for longer, so there's that. Blackhawks, we, we, we lost three NHL teams. There, there you have it. I am still a Blackhawks fan yeah. to this day. So you go with them. And then finally, well, their soccer team sucks, but they don't need soccer because they've got the other four bigs. And so we've got our United. Yeah. We've got our United. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think he was show, throwing shade at all because he did acknowledge that this, this is still a great town. It's just a town where when transplants have to make up their minds on whether they're going to keep their home team like in Chicago or whether they're going to switch over and become a fan of a local team, it really don't happen. Period. I will have to push back just a little bit on that. Not, <laughs> <laughs> because here's the thing when, when, when you talk about fandom of, of said teams, like, yeah, people in Chicago, yeah, they, they, they rock with their team, their pro teams. But when it comes to the Braves, though, we rock with the Braves too. Yes, yes. And everybody in the Southeast too. <laughs> and yes. because when you think about like what TBS and what Ted Turner did yeah, and having them I broadcast, that was, it was just, it was hard not to become a fan of those teams because they Absolutely. were on and they were there. And I've They're even, here. I yeah. got a chance to watch the Cub as well from um, WGN. GN, That's yeah. How, yeah. You know what I mean? So growing up, so it's, I think they're right, like you said, they're right on par with each other. But when you yes. start getting to the other teams, yeah, you know, yeah. that's a case to be made. You know, yes. as a native, right. I can admit that's that. Why you he know said what I'm saying? Holistically, yeah, holistically. When we talking about yes. team to team, like I can line them up. I'm talking about 14 straight division titles, yes. 95, 2021. Y'all got the Cubs got one in 2016. And, you know, before that, I don't even know. <laughs> I know y'all had fandom, one. But... <laughs> right, but the fandom is still the same. That's the thing. Like, right, they've been the go. bad news yeah. bears yeah. as the Cubs for 50,000 years, and those yeah. fans simply do not bulge. They yeah. don't at all. But on that same token, the Braves fans could have bulged, too, because those 14 yeah. straight division titles will make you want to pass out because you only got one World Series out of it. No doubt. Braves yeah. country didn't move. So, yeah, yeah, I think those are the two teams that are probably on par. But when he looks at it holistically – Sorry, Atlanta. Y'all can DM me. Not even close. Be and you know why? Because you whiners and how you complain about everything when it comes to the Falcons. Uh -oh. Miss me with that. Okay? Miss me with it. Because when the Bears complain, they still... See, don't kill them. Don't kill them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, They're dead okay. already. They're dead. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. When the Bears, yeah. When the Bears they, they, go in on, on, so, they go in on the Bears, but I bet you they show up at Soldier Field even when it's below zero. And you Falcons Ooh, Guys, Arthur Smith was out there pleading his case at the beginning of the season that you guys would come there. And sometimes you got to think about that as a fan base. Yeah. It's not always that you just go when there's a quality product. If you are a true fan, think of them Steelers. It gets rough for us because we haven't won a championship in a decade and a half. I'm still mm -hmm. riding with them, though. You guys learn to be those types of fans, and then you won't be mad and think that Dansby's throwing shade. Yeah. Yeah. Well... Yeah, you guys, we want to thank you guys for showing up to our show every day. How about that? And for making ATL Day once your first listen. But I, I want to always remind you, make sure you go check out Locked On Sports today as your second 
listen up today you can find it wherever you find this podcast and last but not least you know i know i know i know the homie was over there throwing shade at the city you know what i'm saying holistically those are whole words you know what i'm saying but we want to make sure that you guys always 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 show love share love and most importantly spread love